Today on page 13 we're going to study several subjects. One is the Yichud, which means fences in the um, law, in the relationship, um, husband-wife, uh, especially in the different time. The second is the Basar uh, Bechalav, which is um, separation in Kashrut between a dairy and meat, uh, especially in the time that uh, some people eat a different uh, food and there is a um, contradiction between the two entities, which is dairy and meat. And the third one is the special 18 halacho that was learned at the um, a, um, the uh, halacho that discuss at the aliyah, the ethics of Hananiah ben Chizkia, 18 point that follow Beit Shammai, which is rare in the Talmud, and not, according to Beit Hillel, follow the vote of the majority. The Mishnah said, at the very end of the Mishnah, a restriction, a new one, that someone will have a um, discharge, he should not eat together with um, a woman that have a discharge because um, they, um, it's the fence that they get close to each other physically and it creates a, a may create a forbidden sexual relation between the two. Tanya Rabbi Shimon Melazar Omer, Bo Re'ad Kama Ad Echan Parzat Tahara Israel. He wants to show how um, um, good is the fences against uh, um, people violating the law of uh, purity that the Torah um, uh, speaks about. Because um, there are certain food, it's called Ma'achalei Chulim, that they eat it, and um, um, the Torah did not uh, forbid uh, two people to eat um, um, together this type of food, but they put a fence around it. The example, The Torah didn't say that this person who poor should not, a pure, should not eat together with um, um, a woman that uh, is not uh, pure, uh, which means the, um, the uh, prohibition here speaks specifically about a discharge of both. So, um, um, so they continue and say, Lo yochala zav parush, which means parush is someone who is more scrupulous in the uh, Dinei Torah, in the Halachot um, of uh, Torah, im am haaretz. So, am haaretz is a very different definition that we call in our days am haaretz. Uh, people think am haaretz is ignoramus, ignorance, uh, people who are really uh, far away from understanding. Um, but in general, Amar Aretz is someone who not study Torah, a fellow that not study Torah, and the, because of lack of knowledge, he can uh, do a lot of things, um, um, maybe unintentionally, but he is in violation of certain things, out of uh, usually out of uh, uh, ignoramacy, out of knowledge. Shema Yargilenu is slow because if. Um, uh, someone who's scrupulous and the Torah scholar sitting together with him, he get used to things that the Amaretz um, uh, does, and it's a problem. Uh, the Gemara asks, what's the problem? They said, The fear is that they get used, the Miangles, they are together, they eat together, they, you know, they schmooze, they watch the Yankee games together, and they do a lot of things together, and as a result, he may start eating things that are problematic, that are forbidden. So they said, Atu Zav, Parush, Lao Dvarim Tmein Nachil. Someone who has a discharge, um, and he is a scrupulous, uh, everything that he touches is becoming pure. So what's the, what's the problem? Amara Bayei, well, I explained that the reason that um, we forbid it is a decree, rabbinical decree. Yes, it's not in the Torah, but it's a rabbinical decree. And what's the rabbinical decree? So they said, Shema Yachilenu Dvarim She'enam Metukanim. 
Um, if you remember, we discussed, a, um, when we studied Brachot once, we discussed Demai, Damai, which means if it's a fruit that needs to take tie, you know, there is a tie that they took from um, a food. Uh, in other words, you have a field, uh, let's say oranges, and uh, you, you uh, need to put a, uh, separate a part to give it as a tie to the uh, Kohen, to give a tie to the poor people, right? And um, someone who's not educated, um, he can feed him with things that need to be tied. So therefore, um, and as long as um, the fellow is Amaaretz, he's not educated, you have a problem to sit and eat with him because maybe he feed him with food. You know, it's like a feeling. You go to a place, oh, you're not eating, everything is kosher. And sometimes... Um, the fellow have no clue what what's kosher means and what's involved in kosher. So it's a very um, um, a delicate point when you're dealing with someone who's not educated. He was an example that maybe he fed him with things that, uh, that they are really um, did not um, uh, put it tight. Nametu Kanim, they said that uh, uh, been rendered um, unusable, uh, food that have not been tight. The Rav Amar, Rav disagreed and he said no. Rov Amei Haaretz Me'asrinen. Again, this is Talmudic time. He heard <coughs> that people who are not educated, they still make sure that they put it tight. Um, the prohibition for eating something that is not tight is a rabbinic prohibition. In other words, you need to have it tight from the, that uh, fruit but um, uh, that the prohibition of eating something that is untied is rabbinic prohibition. So therefore, um, rather hold, uh, because, because we don't uh, do gzera le gzera, we don't put a decree upon decree, so Rashi said, since we hold, as they said in the, in the Tractic to Bot, page 24, that most of the ignorance does uh, making a tide, so uh, the whole idea here is to have extra scrupulous when you're dealing with someone who's not educated. Ella, so why we basically uh, said to uh, someone who uh, have a discharge that he should not uh, sit together with someone who's uh, ignorant and have also discharge? Shema yera gilet slo. And then what happened? So... Um, because they are together, um, he started feeding him, even in those days he already pure, he started feeding him with things that they are not, um, 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 for example, things that are untied. Ibailu. So since we talk about restrictions, putting boundaries, so we now, it's not really digressing, but uh, we're talking about putting boundaries, in a different domain, a different uh, situation. Ibailu, we ask a question. Nida, ma'u shedishanim ba'ala, hi bevigda, vehu bevigdo. So the question is, if you have um, um, a woman that uh, she's nida in her um, uh, period, so it's okay to have one bed for both, she with her garment and he is well garment. What's the problem? The problem is the Torah forbids a sexual relation when she is nida, when when she have a period. Now, the, since they are at the same bed, it may turn that it one sin lead to another because they are the same bed. So therefore, it's a problem. So we put, meaning the sages put a restrictions, and they said it's called yichud imarayot that since a person, for example, the Torah forbids a relation with one with his end. So, does that mean that if I have um, to hand it over something to her, can I, can I shake her hands? Can I hand it over things to her? Why not? But the, 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 the sages put a lot of, of decrees, a lot of uh, boundaries to save us from sin. So, an example, they said, the, soon you see that if they have one bed, it's sometimes a problem because it may lead the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, to a certain um, 
um, seen. Uh, so Amar Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef explained, Tashma, come and I show you a different source, which is Gemara in Chulin, page 104, that said, Ha'of ole im hagvina ala shulchan, ve'enao ne'echal divrei Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai hold that let's say you bought uh, a chicken and you bought a cheese, and you uh, cook the chicken, and then you have Mr., let's call him Reuven, he is now want to eat chicken, and you have Mr. Shimon, that he wants to eat cheese. They have a table, he is in one side, he is in the other side. Is that okay or not okay? So according to Beit Shammai, you can put the chicken and the cheese, or, or the meat and the cheese, at the same table, but Beit Shammai said you cannot eat them together. Why? Because the Torah said you should not cook a kid with its mother's meal, so uh, you, you may think that that's apply only to meat that come out of, uh, for example, cow, but it's not applied to chicken, because the Torah did not forbid um, uh, sar of that a, 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 some type of chicken with uh, with milk. So Beit Shammai hold that even a chicken that uh, it's not in the Torah. Um, uh, at least at the first glance, but um, and we not speak about baking them together, but um, they hold that is a special boundary, a special restriction, not to put them at the same table, because Rashi explained, one especially someone who's not so educated may eat them together because he said, oh, the Torah forbids meat that come from, for example, cow. But um, the rabbinics that say that chicken cannot be eaten, which is, he wasn't familiar, we maybe mix up, Rashi said, tell us. So therefore, Beit Shammai put a boundary and said, you cannot put the chicken and the cheese at the same table. Beit Hillel, the house of Hillel said, Lo ole velo ne'echal. What did Beit Shammai say? Beit Shammai said that you can put it on a, on a chair, on a table but you cannot eat them together. Beit Hillel said, no, 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 no. Not even put it on the same table. The, um, meaning, Beit Hillel agree that the prohibition of, of eating chicken with uh, dairy, it's rabbinic. But the hold that the rabbis uh, uh, forbidden to put them at the same table, uh, because one may lead to another. Um, and some Rishonim ask, all of that is a rabbinic decree uh, that maybe one can have a big pot and it's hot and he want to warm up one of these and he put, mix them together and put it on a pot. Um, so they ask why you do it, but they said that it's all uh, basically boundaries. It's called Gzera Le Gzera, the, the Rashba and Meiri and all of them in, in the Chulim. 104 elaborate, but it's it's decree that one scene may lead to another. That you go ahead and start mixing things around. Uh, I always said, if you remember my uh, lecture in Kashrut, that the person should always have a stickers in his house to say clearly in every item in the, in the kitchen what is dairy and what is meat. For example, in our house, as you know. Um, we always loaded with uh, with guests, and people who come sometimes want to help in the kitchen and want to help uh, wash dishes, dishes, prepare food, but they see a sign, a very clear sign in every single item, what is dairy, what is milk. So it will not be any misunderstanding. Sometimes even things that doesn't need a big sign, but we still put a sign, you know, parv or dairy and, or, or meat. So here, Rabbi Yosef hold that you can compare these two ideas the same way that we are forbidden to put the meat um, um, and the chicken together with the cheese at the same table the same way husband cannot sleep at the same bed with his wife why? meaning we're not talking about the time that they allow we talk about the time that she's nida so why? because we feel that the person is hungry so he's now start eating a chicken and then he feel when he finished the chicken he's still hungry he may go ahead and start eating the cheese 
Why? Because you have Yetzara and he said you're hungry, you don't know when is next time you can eat, so boom, 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 you start eating it. But all of that is a rabbinic decree to put the boundaries. So they said it's the same thing the Ritva tells us that uh, husband and wife, if you, you have both of them at the same bed, and she is Nida, the fear is that it turn a time that he cannot control himself and vice versa, and it's one scene lead to another. So we better, the rabbi said, put the boundaries and say that that's forbidden. So the Gemara said, rejected, the Gemara said, Shane Atam, the Leika Deot. Which means there it's different. When you know people that they um, you remind each other that it's uh, forbidden, so therefore it's different. But here, when it's husband and wife, and each of them should remind his fellow that um, it's forbidden, so therefore we don't have that fear. Again, here is a discussion, because sometimes I'm almost two decades in rabbinate, and I can attest to you that, um, especially with young couple, sometimes it's issue that young men have issue of controlling himself. And, uh, and sometimes uh, they come and complain that it was all kind of um, things that wasn't right. So the reason to put those boundaries, it's in a practical manner, to, um, that's the discussion. Do you uh, basically depend when there are two people that one remind the others that it's inappropriate and that's it, so you don't need to bother with prohibitions? Or because most of the people cannot control themselves, you better put a very clear boundaries so people should not lead to those type of scenes. So here is a discussion. They said, remember, the Talmud most of the time is not the final practical halacha. Practical halacha we mention usually at the end of the shiur. So the Talmud is a discussion that leads later on to final halacha. So you see here the, the dilemma the rabbis have. Here also, um, it's, it's um, appeared, when you have two people sitting around the table, so Reuven reminds Shimon, oh, wait a second, don't you realize this is cheese, this is uh, me, this is, right? Versus if it's one. He holds that if two people are guests in the hotel, you have Mr. Reuven and you have Mr. Shimon. They go to a Sheraton hotel. Reuven, let's say Sheraton in some cities, have kosher food. Reuven brings cheese, Shimon brings uh, meat. They sitting around the table. Reuven eats his food. Shimon eats his food. And what, what's the problem? Uh, if each of them has his own opinion, his own knowledge, you have no fear that one mix. That it's a discussion. So you know, it's not clear yet. You know why? Because if Reuven and Shimon are friends, guess what? Reuven may say to Shimon, "Hey, you got to test, taste this. This is so delicious. It's such a new product the hotel made. You got to taste it." And he eating meat, right? So it's a discussion. So the Gemara disagree with that. They said, "Velavit Maralah, Amar of Chanin Bar Ami, Amar Shmuel, Lo Shanu Ela Sheen Mekrim Zezah, Lo Mekrim Zezah Asuri." Wait a second. If Reuven doesn't know Shimon, so we assume that they don't know each other. I must tell you, when I live in Israel, when we live in Israel for for many years. There's no such a thing you don't know your neighbor, right? Everybody knows everyone in our building. We have 18 tenants in, in the same building. Everyone knows everyone. It was uh, like, like a social building, right? Here, for example, I live in this year a little more than 10 years. In my street, I have to confess, excluding one, maybe two neighbors, I don't know anyone in my street. It's a different, the privacy here, and the, yeah, it's very different. So here you have two people sitting around the table, they hardly say hello to each other, hardly say hi to each other. How many times you walk in the street, you say to someone hi, and they don't bother even to answer, right? So that's different, so you don't be afraid that one mix the food with the other. Versus if Reuven knows Shimon, and they are best friends, 
prove and take cheese, Shimon, take chicken, one may say to the other, come and taste uh, my food, right? So then it's a problem. So Rabbi, it would seem to imply from this that uh, chicken is not, according to Torah law, is not considered the same as other meat. Uh, now we're going to a different subject, mm. but in general, um, Rabbi Sternbuch from South Africa, he is uh, one of the Polskim, one of the rabbis that argue over um, the whole definition of Turkey in, in the sense of kashrut and the whole definition of difference between chicken and other meat. But again, in a very general term, we in our days, in the modern days, 2012, we wrap up all of that as a definition of meat. Even if you go to ancient time, you may differentiate between besar of and besar behema. In our times, it's all wrapped up as meat. As I said, Rabbi Sternbuch deal a lot with the Turkey definition with, um, uh, in his book on Kashrut. I recommend you to read it. But um, um, in our times, everything is under definition of meat. But, of course, but the, we get it from the rabbis, not from, from Torah law. Uh, yes and no. Okay. Because the Torah forbids, they said three times, you shall not mix a kid with its mother's milk. And, and the rabbis um, explained that that's applied to three different prohibitions. One of them is eating, another one is uh, uh, cooking, another one the driving benefit from that. Mm -hmm. So eating, the rabbis derive from that, it's applied to all different kinds of meat. And in our days we say that that's applied also to chicken as well. Mm -hmm. but, so, but the rabbis derive that? The, but what the rabbis derive in our language is became a Torah prohibition in that sense. Oh, okay. Because the rabbis have the strength, the Talmud said, and that's the final halacha, to define and to clarify what the Torah meant. Um, it's the same category as halacha le Moshe Nisinai. Okay. So in that sense, chicken in our day is considering meat, the same as a regular meat that it's from the Torah. It's kind of difficult to swallow some of it because uh, chicken don't produce milk, no turkey. So I said that rabbis have a lot of discussion over chicken. And there are some in the earliest time that hold that chicken is not the same as regular meat. And they try to hold that chicken which will have a different uh, category. Because if you go, as David said earlier, from the Torah, chicken is not biblical. But the rabbis have the authority to put the fences. And therefore, they put a fence in such a level that they have the authority nowadays the same as biblical. So in that sense, we are forbidden to, um, to um, uh, the same prohibition of regular meat, like for example eating tongue or eating meat that come from a regular animal, the rabbis categorize that as a, a, a apply also to chicken as well. So in that sense, it's all wrapped up for our discussion as a biblical. Even you can go ahead and continue arguing that chicken is it's not biblical. But in a practical matter, the way that we teach people, um, it's all prohibited. And um, if you start telling people this is rabbinic, this is Torah, the next thing you see is people mixing the chicken with cheese. So therefore, you make it clear that it's all wrapped up as a biblical period. Okay. So they said here, <coughs> We go back and he said, you said, What do you tell me earlier? You tell me that Reuven and Shimon are best friends. And Reuven said to Shimon, guess what? This uh, meat is delicious. Come and taste. You see here Eddie the chef in the White House, right? Our member and friend, Eddie. He's the chef of the White House how many years? Like two decades? Mm -hmm. Something like that, right? He's from South Africa or Germany or something? Germany originally, but he grew up in South Africa. All right. But he is the White House chef for so many years. And he made all these delicious food. Now he's doing all the stuff uh, kosher, right? So he said, oh, come, Eddie, Eddie made a special meat. And you are eating cheese, right? And you are best friend. You don't even pay attention that it's prohib prohibited. So what we said, you cannot sit and eat the same table 
uh, Reuben eating um, um, meat and you and Shimon eating cheese. You cannot do that, right? Because if they know each other, you cannot allow them to sit around the one table and eat one contradict the other, meat and, and milk. So they ask a question, if that's the case, how come you say to a husband and wife that they know each other and they cannot, if she's nida, they cannot sleep at the same bed? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So they said, hachre hashta. How you can, how you co compare one uh, uh, with the other? Hatam deot hika, shinui leka. Over there with the two people who guest in the hotel, even there are two people um, that maybe remember remember each other, but um, but it's not. They don't change the way that they're eating, the way that they used to eat, because they are in distance. But here, hacha ika deot veika shinui. Um, um, the husband and wife, they have two things. They, number one, they were wearing their garments, the gowns or whatever it is. Number two, they remind each other that it's the time that, uh, um, that they are not allowed to be together. Ika de Amre, another explanation, Tashma. Rabban Shimon Megamliel Omer, Shnei Achsaniyim, Echad, Ochlin al Shulchan Echad, Ze Basar Veze Gvina. He said that uh, he bring another brighter that said that two guests they can sit they can sit and eat around the table one cheese and one meat. Ve'it marala Amar Rav Chanin Barami Amar Shmuel lo shanu ela she'en mekin ze ze avosh mekin ze ze asu. If that's only apply when they don't know each other when they are friends it's a problem. Ve'arenayname makirin ze ze nino and here the husband and wife they are people who know each other. So, therefore, we should forbid them for sleep at the same table. Hatam deot ika shinui leka. Hacha ika deot ve ika shinui. Which means, over there, on the two guests in the Sheraton, even you have deot, meaning the two people, but they don't change the way that they eat, that remind them that they should mix the, the food. But here, when the husband and wife um, they are two together. So you may said, oh, since they're wearing their, their garments, uh, you know, the, the, the nightgown, whatever it is, maybe it's, it's allowed. So we bring another proof. Tashma, we bring another fruit, uh, proof from our Mishnah. Now we're going to our Mishnah. What we say, that a man that have a discharge, and a woman have a discharge, they cannot be together the same table so now think together with me. If this Zav are not allowed to eat with Zava, do you allow them to sleep together? So the Gemara rejected that point. And said, Hachaname, in this case, Deot Ika Shinui Leka. Which means, you have here the opinion, which means one person will remind the other that it's forbidden. Right? But here, the husband and wife, it's not like people who have a discharge. They, it's an issue for them to, to remind each other. So they said here, Tashma, we not to bring another proof. They said in the book of Yechezkel, Ezekiel, chapter 18, is a sentence that said, El Heharim Lo Achal. Heharim literally meaning mountain, but it speaks about a righteous person. And they said, Heharim, it's a ply that a person who is so righteous that he is not asked for the mountain, which is uh, the, our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is not going and ask for the merit of the ancestors, meaning he has his own zchut atzmit, his own merit by himself. He is a righteous person. He is not going to ask because of the merit of his, of, of his ancestors. So he said, Ve'enav lo nasa El Gilulei Beit Israel, that he didn't uh, put his eyes to worship idols, that Eshet Re'ehu Lotime, because the Torah forbids a person to have a private session with his friend's wife, Rashi tells us, because he's not allowed to be with Yehud, Yehud meaning to be together alone with her, so for sure he's not allowed to lay in a bed with. Um, his friend's wife, even they are dressed 
and even the place that it's not the issue of Yichud, Ma'ashat tells us. So they said, Ve'el isha nida lo yikrav. And the woman that is nida, he is not being together. So because all these lines are attached to each other, so we learn makish, eshet nida le eshet reu, hekesh, meaning juxtaposition between two texts. Since in the sentence all of them speaks about Yichud, so we learn from that the same way as Nida, meaning a woman that it's a Ma Eshet Reu, who Bevigdo Vehi Bevigda, Asu, even his friend's uh, wife, he, she is with her garment, uh, she is with dress, and he is dressed, they still not allowed to sleep at the same bed. Therefore, even his wife, when she is nida, if both of them wearing the garment, they still not allowed to sleep at the same bed. Why? Shmamina. Um, uh, you learn so far that this, uh, the husband and wife, even they dress, they cannot sleep together in one bed. Ufliga de Rabbi Pedat. So uh, Rabbi Pedat hold that um, that the Amar Rabbi Pedat lo asra Torah ela kurva shel girarot bilvad. The Torah forbids only sexual, physical, sexual relations. Shnei Amar the Torah said in Leviticus 18, ish ish el kol she'er besaro lo tikrevu l'gedot rba. A person should not come to his she'er besar, meaning someone who is in immediate family to um, have a sexual relations. So, um, so Rabbi Pedat old that all the others is rabbinic, such as, um, you know, hugging closely, kissing, etc. As long as it's not a, a sexual relation, that it's forbidden by the Torah, the rest is rabbinic that put a decree that the person should not do. So, therefore, if both of them Rabbi Pedat hold, dress, which is each of them have their garment, you should not put the decree, even as a rabbinic. So according to Repedat, um, uh, a person can uh, be with his friend's wife uh, as long as they uh, they dress, that's what we understand, but that's not the con final conclusion. Well, here we I'm bring the story. Just a what? question, a more technical question, something here above where it came from Ezekiel, so it came from Nevi'im. Mm -hmm. um, so that's considered, is that, that then has, once it's interpreted, it's the same as rabbinic law. It's not for the writer, because, I mean, it's not from Torah, it's from Nevi'im, right? Even though it's... No. No? Soon you see. Okay. Book of Yechezkel, it's considered, Ezekiel, it's the same as all the um, 24 book of the canon, of the Tanakh. Okay. And we hold that as a sacred document. So anything from Tanakh then is considered if the writer. If the rabbis, if the, it's okay. not everything, okay. it's whatever the rabbis use as a source of a biblical, then they attach that as a another enforcement to one of the mitzvot. So for example, you have 613 mitzvot. You have 270 that are applicable to our times. Within the 613 mitzvot, you have a, um, a 365 and 248, um, positive, negative. Many times you need to bring other sentences to strengthen the mitzvot that's written to us. So you use a Tanakh sentences that reinforce it. For example, here they say that the Nida, you're not allowed to um, come and um, prohibited with. In Ezekiel, that's basically an attachment to the sentence from the Leviticus. Soon you see a discussion of a book of Ezekiel in general. Okay. By the way, that sentence in general, the Radak said in Ezekiel, speaks about a worshipping idols. We derive from that other thing. Ezekiel talked to people about the prohibition of worshipping idols. But that's a side point. Okay. Here is a story. Ula ki hava'atei mi beirav. Ula was a great... Uh, rabbi, when he returned from the study of the of the Beit Hamidrash, Hava Menashek Lachvatei Abei Chadayu, VeAmri Le Abei Adayu. So he um, kissed um, uh, to his sisters and, his, and the hands. So you see 
that um, a, a, even the Torah forbids a relation, physical relation between ancestors, you know, uh, because uh, uh, the Torah forbids a relation within the family, brothers and sisters. Ula, Ula um, didn't do it, he, he kissed his sister's hands. So they said that um, 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 it's like they bring a source, so they said, Uplika di dea di dei. So Ula himself contradicted what he said earlier. Why? Because Ula said, Amar Ula filu shum kurvasu. So Ula said that any type of kurva, any time um, uh, that he got thing attached, it's forbidden. And Tosfot explained to us, and he said that uh, sometimes there is a Yetzer Hara, that uh, right, that even they, they, that uh, um, she wore in garment, she wore in something, it's already, you know, trying to seduce, etc., etc. Mishum lech, lech amre nezira, scho so lekarma lo tikrav, when you have someone who is uh, forbid himself from drinking wine. So the Gemara said to us in Ketubot, that um, um, uh, if someone is a, is a Nazirite and he's forbidden to wine, so you tell him, don't go close to the vineyard. Why? Because you go around the, the vineyard and sooner or later, guess what? You're going to close by and start drinking, right? So that applies not only to Nazirite. It applies also to someone who forbid himself from shay or, or touch to the dead, etc. So... Um, um, so basically what's the ask they ask that the Ula what we see that he in one hand said that you even to Nezirite you said that you should stay away yet here he kisses his sister as hand so the how come so the Tosfot said that that's applied to Ula himself he was a tzaddik he was a pious righteous person so you cannot compare him to, to lay people right but um, Rambam said in uh, Hilchut Esorei Bia 21, Rambam said, I'm quoting the Rambam, Hamechabek achat min arayot she'en she'libon ha'adam nokfo alem. If someone gets an attachment to one of the Torah prohibition, but kegon achoto agola v'achoto otimo, for example, his older sister, his aunt, so he has a physical attachment with her, even you may say that he has no desire and is, doesn't drive a joy. He call it something that is uh, disgusting, something that is inappropriate, the Rambam said. He said that that's, that's forbidden and it shouldn't, shouldn't happen. Why? You may say that, but he knows that it is... Um, and, but still, the Rambam said that we should have boundary. It's inappropriate. Tana de Veliao. Here is a, a story that tried to prove um, um, what we discussed. The Veliao, in general, it means that um, uh, when we use a Liao, there is uh, two options. Some say that his name of Tana, one of the rabbis. The Chida hold um, that, that applied to real Elijah after he went to heaven that um, uh, that it's a real Elijah. So, you can take it either way. Which means it was a student that was heavily involved with Torah. He learned a lot, he learned Mishnah, and he learned much of the Torah scripture, and he spent much time serving the Torah scholar, which is that... Uh, and that they go deeper in understanding the Talmud, and all of a sudden, umet b'chatzi amav, and he passed away half of his years. So if we follow what we said in the book of Psalms, yemei shnotenu b'hem shiv'im shana, the book of Psalms said that our lives is 70 years, even the Torah said in Bereshit, 120, but King David said 70, 80 years, he said that's the, the, the life of people. So chatzi amav, it's like 35, 40, he died young. So the Tosfot Horosh said, because the Isaiah tells us that Tfilin, Vashem Alem Yichyu, that Tfilin bring a length of life, so she took his pair of Tfilin. And he came to the house of study, and she said to them, it's written in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 30, 
כי הוא חייך ואורך ימיך. חייך meaning life in this world, אורך ימיך is in the world to come. So as she said, you tell me that feeling bringing the length of life. בעלי ששנה הרבה וקרה הרבה, my husband that he studies so much. ושימש תלמידי חכמים הרבה, we are the flipping the page to the TV, and my husband spent much time serving Torah scholars. מפני מה בית בחצי ימיו, why he died young? ולא היה אדם מחזיר הדבר. None of the uh, rabbis give any explanation why that happened. פעם אחת נתארחתי אצלה, again, אליהו said that one time I visited her. So again, she saw a uh, Torah scholar, so she put her heart, and she said, והייתה משיחה לקרוא לו תומורה. She told me what happened with her husband. ואמרתי לה, and I said to her, ביתי, my daughter, בימי נידותך, מהו אצלך? Tell me the truth, in those days that you are together with him. Um, and you have your period, you have your nidas time. How you uh, interact with him. Amrali, she said to me, Chaz v'shalom, afilu ba'etz ba'ktana lo nagabi. God forbid, he did not touch me even on my little finger. He never touched me. Then he asked her, Bimei li bunech ma'u etzlech? During the days of you white clothing, what did we do with you? which means, as you know, there is a certain period after finishing the Nida period, there is another period that um, uh, until she goes to the Mikveh is a period that it's under category of Nida, even she stopped bleeding. Okay? 5-7. So they said, ולא עלה עלתה דעתו על דבר אחר. So she said, אכל עמי ושתן עמי וישן עמי יקרו בשר She answered, she said, yes, he ate with me, he drank with me, he, he slept with me without clothing. But we did not even think about any other things. So, bless his God who get rid of him. Why? Because your husband did not show respect to the Torah. Right? Because um, he, even he was a Torah scholar and make a mistake. that uh, he did not go clearly by what the Torah said שהרי אמרה תורה ואל אישה בנידת תומתה לא תקרא the Torah said clearly when a woman has the nidas time you should uh, uh, make a separation you should not attach כי אתה רב דימי אמר רב דימי when he came from ארץ ישראל to Babylon he said מיתה חדה הווי The prohibition is when they sleep in the same bed. Tosfot explained to us that it's a, uh, it was a fellow, Palti ben Laish, that he put like a sword between the, the, the bed, between the two of them. But they, uh, it's important to know that Yoredea in Kuf Tzadikhet, Yoredea in uh, 195, he said that the prohibition is to have it the same bed. You know, like, like whatever it's called, king side, the big bed. במערב האמרי אמר רב יצחק בר יוסף סינר מפסיק בינו לבינה It's like a short pants separate between them I must tell you that over the years for I marry for about 28 years so from time to time you have contractors like non-Jewish painters and people who come to do all kind of jobs in my house So, over the years, I heard comments. Ah, look at what happened. They have two separate beds. You know, we have two separate beds. Um, uh, the whole idea is, it's a different level, how, but uh, basically the proper way in halakha is to have two separate beds, and you put like a little, um, whatever, a drawer or something in between, and the time that they allow to be together, then you move that, and you attach the two beds together as one bed, which means nowadays they made a bed that you can um, detach and attach. And it take you two seconds, you just separate them and you put something in between. Mm -hmm. That's the proper way in halakha, which means uh, is the time that you can make it as one, is there's the time you have to make it as separate. Mishnah. Ve'elu min ha'alachot sh'amru ba'aliyat chananiyah ben chizkiyah ben garon. 
It was a righteous person, whose name is Hananya ben Chizkiya. Uh, the Rambam said in an uh, explanation of the Mishnah that he was a Dolador, that he was a, a great man of his generation. And he took upon himself a special mission to explain the book of Ezekiel. What is all about? The book of Ezekiel have a lot of things that at the first glance for someone who's not so familiar looks like a contradiction in the Torah. Soon the Gemara elaborate on that. And this righteous Hanania, he um, 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 took upon himself, the Gemara tells us later, to sit and give us full explanation what Ezekiel meant in his writing in order to use Ezekiel as one of the holy sacred 24 books of the canon. So the sages from time to time went to visit him because he was by himself in isolated place in his uh, aliyah, it's like in his uh, attic special room for study. So at that time it was many students of Beit Shammai and many students of Beit Hillel. And as you know, they always took a vote when it was a con um, contradiction or dispute. Venimnu verabu Beit Shammai al Beit Hillel. So they took a vote. And the Torah tells us in the book of Shmot, you follow by the majority, Achare Rabim Le'atot, in uh, Exodus 23. So therefore, they took a vote. And in that vote, which rarely happened, the vote goes by the house of Shammai. It was 18 subject that they put a decree according to Bet Shammai. So a few points. First of all, it's not 18. It's a machloket rishonim. Uh, it's a dispute among the early sages if it's 18 or it's more than 18. It's mainly in regard to, to purity and impurity, to Mautara, but it's not all the decrees. So now the, the Gemara said, Amar le Abayel le Rav Yosef, Eilu Tnan O Ve'eilu, the, uh, the Amaran. Which means, you remember that we said two days ago that it was uh, two important things that they learned, which is a person should not, you remember we talked about lice, to remove the lice yesterday, you know, the um, removing lice from Shabbat, or to uh, tintle the candle, you remember we discussed that? So when you use the word ve'elu, which means in addition, elu is the specific um, uh, list. So you mean to say that that 18, including also the two, the one that tinted the candle and one in regard to, what is the second one? One tinted the candle and one in regard to remove lice on Shabbat. These two important halachot, is that including the 18 or not? Or elu de baina de tnan de baina lemer kamar, or only the least that we are about to say. So they said tashma, come and see from different brayta. Ain polin lo oraner ve'en kolin lo oraner, which we, we said earlier, for yesterday, that um, uh, two things like uh, tinkle the candle on Shabbat and removing the 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 lice on Shabbat, right? So use the Vav, Ve'elu, so it means that these two, Shema Mina, remember we said twice Shema Mina, it means that's the final word, which means the two that we discussed earlier are part of this discussion. It's all together, 18. Tanu Rabbanan, Mi Katav Megilat Ta'anit. So they ask a question, who wrote the work entitled Megillat Ta'anit? What is Megillat Ta'anit? It was a special scroll that gave a list of the extra special first day. In general, there is a rule that said that things that we um, write, you not, Dvarim uh, Shebikhtav, Iyataomram Alped. It's things that you write, you don't say it orally. There are certain things that you're um, allowed to write, there's things that you don't write. So in that scroll, it's the list of days that we should not fast because miracle occurred on those days. The, the, in the Talmud, you see it, uh, for example, when we study Rosh Hashanah, we study Ta'anit, etc. So it's called scroll because um, um, uh, things that you, um, uh, um, orally, you don't put it in writing. So um, uh, Rashi explained to us that the, the, 
um, that uh, prohibition of not fasting in those days apply only in the era of the second Beit HaMikdash, the second temple. But then, after the, it's, uh, too many sorrow happens, so they annul that scroll. So that scroll basically put a list of miracle, and therefore, because in those days miracle happened, they ask people not to fast in those days. Okay? So they said here, Amru Hananya ben Chizkiya Vesiato, which means uh, the Hananya ben Chizkiya, remember the one we just mentioned in there? So he and his team and his group, they together put all the list of um, date that miracle happens and therefore we should not fast in those days. Shehayu mechabevim et hatsarot. What does that mean, mechabevim? That they like the source? So Rashi tells us, no. It means that shenigalim um, mehem, because this is the days that uh, we have a miracle upon those days, that miracle good, good things happen. Ve'anes chaviv alem, and because they are so full of gratitude for thanking Hashem for those miracles, they want to praise God for the miracle. And they write down those days that miracle happened. To make them as a day of celebration. These are the list of days that we should not make a fast day. So Marshal asked, and the Rashi and the Meiri, so how come we use the word Mechabevim et Tatsarot, that they, they uh, cherish troubles? Shoshe said that they cherish miracles, right? So, so he explained that they interpreted sorrow, um, as we learn in Brachot, as a good thing. So that is like, this is an attitude in faith, that when a person suffers sorrow, in this world is better than to suffer a sorrow in the world after life. Which means sometimes Hashem punish a person, give him a slap on his face, and now he is basically forgiven and, and clean and tikkun and atone from his sins. So they like the sorrow because they know that that way they are clean, part of cleansing from their sins. Anyway, that's the martial interpretations. Amar Rabban Shimon Megamliel, that's applied to the second Rabban Shimon Megamliel, that, uh, he lived uh, two generations after the destruction of the temple at the era of Hanania. And he said, Af'anu mechabevim et atzarot. We also a, um, appreciate the trouble, um, uh, he says, because the, and, and we recognize the miracle that happened to us in a daily basis. But he said, and we shall uh, schedule a date of, uh, of, um, of a celebration those days. Aval Oh, there are so many sorrows days that occur to us that if we're about to start writing all these great sorrows that occur to us, then uh, <coughs> there are too many. <coughs> too many. Davar acher, another way to look at this, and he said, Ein shote nivga. Ein shote nivga, someone who's... Um, um, Shote, it's uh, uh, foolish, or, or someone who's uh, not smart does not get attacked. So Rashi explained to us what does that mean. Ein pegara ba'alav, which means someone who's who's um, who's um, you know uh, foolish, he doesn't recognize the sorrow. So, and then he said. What does that mean, Klomar? And you remember we said that when Rashi used Klomar, he, he have something that bothered him. So I wrote in my uh, book, uh, Biura Klomar and Rashi, that's one of my books, explanation of this Rashi. Eino makir bivga'am, which means that, the, that he, um, in a sense, does not recognize that um, it's a um, hurt. Imagine a person that he is a mental a case, and um, and somebody hits him, and he's not realized that the person hitting him because he doesn't have the mental capabilities. So here, try allegorically or metaphorically to explain the meaning here, that the difference between a person who's um, smart or someone who's foolish, 
is the smart person knew that is no bad things happen from Hashem. Everything is for good. So therefore, he recognized uh, that that the sorrow that occurred to him is in order to sweeten, um, um, you know, his life to sweeten the the afterlife. It's like a sick person. So you give him a bitter, bitter medication, right? So he take it. Why he take it? And he's glad and he's happy to take that medication. Why? Because he knew he get better if he take it. So in that sense, Rashi said that Hashem, because uh, he uh, loved the person, he gave him the medication. So he, when he gets this bitter medication, he thank God because he knew that that's basically help him, uh, healing him. So a person who have a faith, he uh, thanking God for, for, for that healing. But a person who's foolish, and when he feels sorrow, he start gets angry, and uh, sometimes he start blaming, and he goes to a very strong language uh, um, uh, um, when he express himself. So that's um, the way I think Rashi meant when he used the word klomar. Davar achel en psaramet margish beizmel. He said, a dead person, if you take a knife and you cut part of, of his skin, he doesn't feel it. So in that sense, because we have so much sorrow, they talk about those days that they are full of sorrows, right? You read the Jewish history. So therefore, we are like, in a sense, like a dead people, that if someone come to a dead person and touch uh, with a knife, the dead person, a person that feel, uh, dead pe people don't feel it. Um, um, so Amy, is that true? Now, a little bit Kabbalah, a little bit mystical part. I know that Gil like that, right? V'amar Rav Yitzchak, kashar rima lamet kemachat bebasar hachai. So Rav Yitzchak said that worms are painful to the dead as pins to the flesh of the living. Shenemar, they said in the book of Eov, chapter 14, Ach besaro alav ichav, but his flesh will paint over itself, and his soul will mourn over itself. So it means that the dead person feels the pain. He maybe cannot express himself, but he feels the pains. Um, um, some say that that's not applied to the body, that's applied to the soul. That uh, they said in the Sefer Hasidim that uh, the soul um, feels that someone is basically uh, attached to the body or create pain for the body. Uh, but again, that's a little bit uh, Kabbalah. Um, Eima, so you may say that it doesn't mean the, the, the flesh of a dead person. Ein basar amet shebechai margish beizmel. It's not speaking about a dead body. It speaks about a person that, for example, you are a lot in the army training. So you know in the army, sometimes when you use, for example, you walk a lot, you exercise a lot, there are yabalot, there are certain area in the body that's already all the skin, it's like um, with so much use that you don't, ha you don't carry a feeling like horses, yeah. you know, the, the feet. Callus. What? Yeah, calluses. Calluses, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, if you take a knife and you touch that area, there's no feeling. So they said it applied to the dead part, calluses of the body, that don't feel the ismel, don't feel the knife that attach it. That's what it means. And it's allegorically, it's applied to what? To us, since we suffer with so much sorrow, we don't even feel, you know, anymore this type of um, feeling of expressions. Amarav Yudah Amarav, Beram, Zachur Oto Ish Latov. So he said that you should, you should uh, remember that that man, which is Hanan ibn Chizkia, who should remember favorably. Why? Without him, the book of Ezekiel will be concealed, which means will be forbidden to read, because at the first glance it appears that Ezekiel contradicted the Torah. Why? Take for example, they said in Ezekiel um, 44 that um, <coughs> all the dead body, the 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 Kohanim, Kol nevela utrefa lo yochlu a kohanim. That um, uh, uh, any dead um, uh, animal, the priest will not eat. So what do you understand? If you li read literally Ezekiel, Ezekiel meant only the priest not eat it, 
but others can eat, right? But in the Torah we say that uh, the the nevela and trefa, bad animals and non-kosher animals, we have, it's forbidden to everyone. So Measa, what what uh, righteous men Hanan and Bechizkiah did, Helulo Shlosh Mot Garbei Shemer Yashav Ba'ila V'Darshan. This is again is a language of uh, Talmud. I just want to say that it's a lot of uh, things they prepare for him. They brought him 300 barrels of oil. It means that they brought him a lot of uh, th- stuff. And he sat in his upper chamber and he explained each and every line of Ezekiel to make sure that people not misconstrue. And in that sense, we will understand. So for example, here he said that that even a priest are forbidden to touch Nevela Utrofa. It's not just the priest, and even him. That's what Ezekiel meant. And what we said in the Mishnah, that in that day it was 18 things that they put a decree in that day, mining Ushmonasa. Now we need to have a list of the 18. What is the 18? So the, now they bring the list of the 18. So as we said earlier, it's, it's mainly the 18 measures of Tumayo Torah. And these are the lists that make the truma uh, unfit. One who eats food, is a rishon, which was the first decree that acquired truma. One who eats food that have sheni, that become the second one in truma. Liquid that touch the tamay again, he become the sheni because it's a liquid. Uh, the number four and one whose head and, and the greater part of his body entered to a, a drowned water. Okay, number five, we just give the list and tomorrow we elaborate on that. Vetahor Shinafalo Roshov Rubo, and the person was a pure upon whose the head was greater part of the body or fell. Shlosha Lugi Maim Shuvim, three Lugin of drawn water, become Shinilatuma, Ve Ha Sefer, and the scroll, the, the scripture text. Again, the, uh, the, the scroll is a Sheni Letuma, Vehaya Daim, and the unrings hands, which is a Sheni Letuma, Vehatvul Yom, a person that needs to count seven days, and that day that he needs to go to the Mikveh, so that day it's a Tvul Yom, that day it's regarded as Sheni Letuma, Vehochlim, Vehakelim, Sheni Tmu, Vemashkin, and the, um, and the uh, foot stuffs, and the articles that uh, contain Tuma from the Tamil liquids, so all of that, it's, uh, th- that's the um, list. Mantana, the one who eats food, that eats Rishon, is the first one in Tuma. One who eats food, that is the second. Mifsal Pasley, Tamuye, Lo Mitmu, which means he become unfit to contact because he is a Shini, the second one. Um, and, and the Itame in the sense of the third uh, decree, Tamuye, but regards to the Tuma contamination, Lome Tamu is not rendered the Tame, is not rendered Tame as a Shini. So Rashi explained, that he cannot take the Tuma, and she became the Tuma, the second one, and then it's uh, make others um, um, Pasul. Practical Lachot, the first one is. לא אסרה תורה אלא קורבה של גילוי אריות בילבד. The Torah prohibited in intimacy that involved engaging in prohibited sexual relations. So um, that um, uh, the whole idea is that if a husband and wife are the same bed, it may lead to um, sexual relations. Uh, so therefore. Um, um, that's not the case to other relatives, but here we speak specifically about husband and wife. Um, um, the next halacha is Afilu Shum Kurva Asu. The Rambam in Ilchot Bisurei Bia 21, chapter 21, he said, Even any intimacy is forbidden. Why may not have a, a, any physical intimacy um, with women with whom sexual relations is for, uh, for, forbidden? Right, with the exception of his mother or uh, daughter, which means this prohibition apply even if he derives no pleasure, and his evil inclination is not stimulated. But that's the statement of Ula. So a person should be careful in that area. Even he may say that it's no uh, uh, desire. And um, another important halacha 
that uh, uh, we learn today, it's the whole concept of a arayot, and that's my concluding halacha. That uh, the rabbi said is a lot of things is like looks like an open area. So we explain that the proper decorum is it is a husband to wife to have a detach and attach bed, which means that basically you detach it, but the time that they allow to be together, you can attach the bed, and in between you put some separations. So the person, Yetzer Hara, the desire will not, you know, overwhelm him at the time that she is forbidden to him. Yeah.